Good morning, everyone. My name is Nadine Faza, and I'm one of the structural heart imagers at Houston Methodist. I'd like to welcome you to our grand rounds today. And we have a very special guest speaker, Dr. Ziad Hijazi, who will be discussing transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. You can join us by web by going to polev.com, enter the bay key, and you can enter your question. Alternatively, you can join by text by texting the bay key to 37607 and text in your message. It's an honor to introduce my mentor, Dr. Ziad Hijazi. Dr. Hijazi is a professor of pediatrics and medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine, New York. He's a chief medical officer and chair at Sidra Heart Center. He's a world-renowned interventional cardiologist who specializes in treating congenital and structural heart disease in both children and adults. He's a pioneer in the non-surgical repair of congenital and structural heart defects. Professor Hijazi completed his postgraduate training from the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health at Yale University, where he was subsequently awarded a Master's of Public Health. He remained at Yale University, where he completed a residency in pediatrics and a fellowship in pediatric cardiology. Upon completion of his fellowship training in 1991, he joined the faculty at Tufts University School of Medicine. And in 1999, Professor Hijazi accepted a faculty appointment at the University of Chicago as endowed professor of pediatrics and medicine and chief of the division of cardiology. In 2007, Dr. Hijazi became the director of the Rush Center for Congenital and Structural Heart Disease at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And in 2008, he became the 31st president of the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions. In 2014, he became the inaugural chair of pediatrics at Sidra Medicine, and in 2021, became the chief medical officer. In the year 2020, Professor Hijazi became the founding president of a newly formed Big Society Pediatrics and Congenital Interventional Cardiovascular Society. Dr. Hijazi is very prolific with more than 360 peer-reviewed published articles, nine books, and over 60 book chapters and hundreds of abstracts. His major area of interest is the development of techniques and transcatheter devices to help treat and cure congenital and structural cardiac disease without the need for open heart surgery. He performed the first case of ASD closure using the Amplazer device in the US in 1997. He has been a primary investigator and national PI in testing the Amplazer family of intracardiac devices in the US. These studies resulted in the FDA approving the first ASD closure device and first VSD device for use in children. He successfully performed the first pulmonary valve implantation of its kind in the US in 2005 on a 16-year-old boy. Further, he did the first human implantation of pulmonary valve in the world using the venous P valve in 2013. Professor Hijazi's work has not been limited to the non-surgical repair of cardiac defects. He was the first to describe how intracardiac echo can be used to assist in guiding transcatheter closure of ASD and ZIN PFO. It's an honor having us with us today, Dr. Hijazi. Welcome to Houston Methodist Thank virtually. So Thank you so much, uh, Nadine. Uh, it's an uh, absolute uh, privilege and a pleasure to be uh, with you. And I'm sorry that I am with you virtually uh, due to uh, uh, you know, schedule as well as, of course, to the pandemic. Uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation and introduction, Nadine, and I want to thank Dr. William Zorbi for the kind invitation as well. Uh, it's indeed uh, my pleasure and honor to be with you, and I hope that over the next 45 minutes to an hour, I'll share with you some of the knowledge that we have accumulated over the last few years on transcatheter uh, pulmonary valve implantation. If I may just uh, share the slides now. So this is my first slide here, disclosure uh, conflict of interest, as Nadine mentioned uh, in this slide, I have uh, stock options in a couple of companies that uh, cater to pulmonic valve. But before that, this is Nadine, she's still young, but this when she was younger working a postdoctoral fellowship in my program in Chicago in 2012. And I can tell you, we have had many postdoc fellows, but not because Nadine is with us, she was phenomenal and she continues to be phenomenal. I want to commend her uh, hard work in structural heart disease. So let's talk about pulmonary valve replacement. So we all know that significant pulmonary regurgitation results in progressive right ventricle dilatation and ventricular dysrhythmias. And this will lead to definite uh, sudden cardiac death. Pulmonary valve replacement at an appropriate age 
may restore the right ventricle function and improve the symptoms. And we know by now that early experience with a transcatheter pulmonary valve is safe and very encouraging. When you send uh, your patient to the surgeon to have a pulmonic valve replaced between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery, the surgeons usually use one of three things, either a homograft or a cloth tube with a valve inside it, or the bovine jugular vein, the contegra. All these three things, when they uh, degenerate, they result in stenosis, and some patients may have regurgitation. Some surgeons, they use prosthetic valves in the right heart circulation, but in general, this is not recommended because of the higher chance of thrombosis. So in general, it's either a homograph, a cloth tube, or the contegra. The surgery for this patient is not mortality-free. So the first operation, usually a mortality of 4%, and each replacement or repeat operation has higher and higher mortality so that by the fourth re-up, the mortality goes to 13%. The lifespan for the homograft is about 16%, and for the tissue valves, xenografts, is about 10%. So we know that if we put a homograft in a child at, let's say, five or six or seven years of age, by the time they make it to age 60, 70, at least they undergo three to four re-operation. However, if you look at data from the literature, the rate of dysfunction of these homograft is actually much higher. So this is a paper from Circulation. Jim Twiddle, a famous cardiac surgeon, looked at his first 100 homographs. By about four and a half years after the operation, 25% of the patient had dysfunctional homograft. And if you look in red, half the patients already had dysfunction and 25% of the patients already underwent re-intervention, whether it's operation or catheter intervention. So the question is when to replace the pulmonic valve? Because, you know, the aortic valve, the mitral valve, we have good criteria and everybody agrees on them. The pulmonic and the tricuspid are less, uh, you know, clear. So we have uh, put guidelines as to when to replace the pulmonic valve. This flow diagram uh, talks about primarily patients with tragic flow. If they have severely de uh, decreased function, LV or RV, everybody would say, you know what, go ahead and replace that. If they don't have LV or RV dysfunction, you look at the severity of the pulmonary insufficiency. If it's mild PR, then you follow them up. If moderate or more or severe, then you look at symptoms. If they have symptoms, then definitely replace the valve. If they do not have symptoms, then you have to look at more objective criteria. So you have two or more of the following criteria, everybody would agree, replace the valve. So number one, LV systolic dysfunction, severe RV dilatation, and that's obtained by cardiac MRI. If the RV in diastolic volume indexed more than or equal to 160 ml, then that's a criteria. If the in systolic volume is more than 80 ml per meter squared, that's also a criteria. If the RV in diastolic volume is more than twice that of the left ventricle, that's a criteria. In cases where the majority of the pathology is obstruction rather than regurgitation, if the RV systolic pressure is more than two thirds systemic pressure, that's a criteria. So you look at this progressive reduction in objective exercise tolerance as documented by stress test is also a criteria. However, there are also patients they may have arrhythmias. So if the patient has tachyarrhythmias, then you replace the valve. If the patient does not have tachyarrhythmia, you look at residual lesions. If they have residual lesions, then you need to address these residual lesions. If not, then you need to re replace the pulmonic valve. All these uh, you know, guidelines, they do not meet class one criteria. They're all class two A or class two B. And that's actually true in the majority of patients with congenital heart disease. So this is a summary, as I mentioned, you look at the patient, if they're symptomatic, uh, New York heart disease class two to three, then you replace it. If they're asymptomatic, then you need to look at the MRI criteria. How, how do you assess uh, pulmonary insufficiency? And again, unlike uh, aortic insufficiency or mitral regurgitation or stenosis, the PR was more of a problem. Physical examination may give you something, EKG, echo, cardiac CT, cardiac MR, and cardiac cath. 
look at the echo, you look at the ratio of the width of the regurgitant jet color flow to the annulus. If it's more than 65%, that's significant PR. Holodiastolic retrograde flow in the distal pulmonary artery, that's important. Doppler estimates of the regurgitant diffraction. RV ejection fraction and volume. And this is, again, very difficult to obtain by echo. LV function. Estimation of the RV pressure, if you have a, a TR jet, that will be helpful. Localization of the obstruction, if you can see it in the uh, you know, RV of the tract or the branch pulmonary artist, and of course, Doppler tissue imaging. But we know that echo is not accurate at all because it all is dependent on the operator, how they do this. So these are images showing you that significant pulmonary insufficiency in the short axis view. If you do the Doppler and the MPA, the retrograde flow, if the area under the curve is more than the uh, anti-grade flow, then this is significant insufficiency. People look at the pulsatility index. You, you Doppler the RPA in short axis. If the ratio is more than 1.2 to 1 in diastole, then this is definitely significant regurgitation. And people look at the RV uh, area. Again, this is true and good if you do the same patient by the same operator. But if different uh, patients and different operators, it may not be accurate. Then we move to cardiac CT scan. The importance of the CT scan, it gives you uh, good data about the RV of the tract. You can look at the MPA size, the branches, whether there's obstruction. You can also look at a very important uh, 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 issue here is the proximity of the coronary artery from the RV of the tract because if the left main or LAD is very close to the RV of the tract so that when you put a stent in the RVOT, there's a chance of compressing the coronary, that is disaster. So it is your job to make sure that the coronary arteries are far from the uh, from the RV of the tract. And of course, if you do the CT scan, you can always do a 3D model. And by doing a 3D model, actually, it's very helpful to show it to the patient, to show them where is the area of uh, concern, where we are going to put the valve, and all of this. Then you go to the gold standard, which is the cardiac uh, MRI. The cardiac MRI, you can get exact function of the RV as well as the LV. You can look at the regurgitant diffraction. And again, regurgitant diffraction, more than 40% is severe PR. 30 to 40 is moderate, less than 30 is mild PR. You can look at residual leaches. You can look at the MPA and the branch pulmonary arteries. So you can really do a lot with cardiac MRI. The, the downside with MRI, you need anesthesia if the patient is not cooperative because the test takes at least 30 minutes. Finally, cardiac cath. Why do we need to take them to the cath lab? We take them to the cath lab for different purposes. One of them, of course, is diagnostic to do uh, look at the pressures, check the pressure of the right ventricle compared to the LV, look and see if there are any uh, shunt areas, left to right or right to left. You can also do the pressure uh, volume loops, and you can do the regurgitation fraction from that. And of course, last but not least, you can do RV uh, and geography, MPA and geography to look at the branch pulmonary arteries to make sure there is no distortion at all. And of course, you can do balloon sizing to look at the size of the MPA, and that will help you determine what size valve I need to implant there. And also at the same time when you have balloon sizing of the RVOT, inject in the ascending aorta or selective coronaries to assist the distance from the coronary arteries to the RV outflow tract. Finally, this is showing you just a patient with severe PR, you can see, see very low diastolic pressure. These are now videos of a patient. You can see injection in the MPA. You can see frontal and lateral significant pulmonary insufficiency and large MPA. Then you do balloon sizing. You occluded the RV or the tract while you're injecting in the RV. And you can measure exactly the size of the MPA by doing this. And then do the same thing while you're injecting in the ascending aorta to look at the coronary arteries. It is important you do two orthogonal views because if you do one view, you will get deceived and you can say, oh, the left main looks good. But if you miss the, left, the lateral, you may miss a, a good uh, stenosis in the 
left main coronary artery. So now we know that the patient needs a van. So what are the currently approved vans? US, outside the US. In the US, Melody van approved by both US and outside. Edwards van, US and outside. Harmony, US only. Venus B van, outside the US only. Now, who are our patients? So if you look at the number of patients born each year with congenital heart disease, approximately 1.6 million patients each year born with congenital heart disease. Out of those, about 350,000 have anomalies related to the right ventricle of the tract. And out of those, about 30%, 105,000 patients, they have a conduit between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. And you can see the number of patients. So this side of the slide on the right-hand side are the patients that can be held using the Edwards valve and the Melody valve. On the left-hand side of the equation or the slide are the patients who underwent transannular patch or what we say native alpha tract. And those are the majority of the patients, about 70, 75% of the patients. Again, let's talk about the valves. This is the melody valve, bovine, jugular vein, sewn inside a platinum iridium stent. They call it the cheetah platinum stent. It's uh, radio opaque. It comes available in sizes up to 22 millimeter, and the length is 28 millimeter, and the crimping profile is six millimeters. So it requires a 22 French delivery sheet in the femoral vein. This is an X-ray showing you the radio opacity. The design is flexible. It really conforms well, low recoil rate. The delivery balloon, it's called BIB, balloon in balloon. Two balloons in one balloon, a smaller balloon, and then a larger balloon. And we did that specifically to prevent for shortening and balloon rupture from the stent. Again, the balloon comes in sizes 16, 18, 20, and the 22 millimeter, and it's 22 French. And the valve is actually covered, if you can see the cover. So you crimp it, and then you cover it by that sheath there. And that's a major advantage because you can go all the way to wherever you want. If you change your mind, you can always withdraw without any problem at all. The valve underwent many studies, as you can see from 2000 all the way until it received full PMA in 2015 in the United States. The second valve, the Edward Sapien valve, XT and the S3, as I mentioned, or, or Nadine mentioned, I did the first a human implantation in the in the world with the Edwards valve in 2005 in Chicago using the uh, Sapien valve. The Sapien valve is made of bovine pericardial leaflets and the stint is cobalt chromium. Diameters that are available 20 to 29 millimeter and the sheath is 16 to 21 French. So it's smaller than the Melody valve. How do you pre-select your patients? And this is really important for the general cardiologist. Patients with homograft from the RV to the PA, size of the homograft is known to be at least 22 millimeter in diameter. Weight has to be about 35, but I can tell you we did patients as small as a 12 and a half kilo. But if you want the, the criteria, 35 kilogram and above, no active infection, and this is very important. Uh, prior, uh, six months prior to the uh, procedure, patent femoral vessels, but we are also able to do, to do it from the jugular. Patients with transannular patch, as long as they can be stented. So you need a landing zone. So we have done patients post uh, native or transannular patch. What are the tests that you do? Initially physical exam, EKG, uh, chest X-ray, all of this, blood testing, hemoglobin, hematocrit, electrolytes, all of this, 12 lead EKG, 24 hour halter, and uh, then you do an MRI stress test and as well as CT angio to look at the coronary arteries. Then you take them to the cath lab. Your cath lab has to be equipped with everything. These procedures are expensive. And to take a patient to the cath lab and you cancel your uh, procedure because you're not uh, equipped, that's no excuse. So by plane is preferable, but could we do it with single plane? Yes, but then you have to keep moving the, uh, the plane back and forth and you may need to do more angiography and more contrast load. So now 
percutaneous. I always use the periclose to pre-close the, the puncture, but if you don't use the, uh, the uh, periclose, you can actually do the figure of eight stitch at the end. You need end hole catheters, super stiff wires. And when I mean super stiff, these are the stiffest guide wires available in the industry. Meyer wire or the lender quest, multi-track catheters, Mullins long sheaths, bib balloons, and of course, stents. You have to have stents available to you, all diameters, all lengths, and of course, high pressure balloons. And these are the stents that we have stuck in our lab. The Palmas series, the P3, the P4, the Max LDs, the uh, outside the US, Andra stents, XL and XXL, and the Bentley. Cover the stents are important because some of these uh, homographs are very calcified. And if you dilate them, they will crack and they will dissect and they will rupture. And if you don't have something to bail you out, you should not be doing these procedures in your cath lab. Also availability of surgical backup is really important in the hospital. It does not have to be in the cath lab. As long as you have a surgeon available to you in the hospital, you are good. TEE and ICE is optional. I almost always do my procedures un under either TEE or ICE to look at pulmonary insufficiency and look at all of this. Snares are important. The steps in the cath lab, you achieve access in the femoral veins as well as the femoral artery for arterial monitoring. And then you do full hemodynamic study to look at everything. And then you position a wire, preferably in the left pulmonary artery. If not, the right pulmonary artery should be okay, but preferably the left because the trajectory is much better and the tracking is much better. Then we do balloon sizing with uh, a balloon in the uh, MPA for the size. And the same step when you inject in the ascending artery to look at the coronary arteries. And then you do this in every patient. You cannot cut corners at all. So this is selective coronaries. You can see the conduct is very calcified. So you don't even need to put a balloon there in this patient. As you can see, free pulmonary insufficiency. Then you need to put your landing zone, because this is a conduit that's calcified. We need to put a landing zone. Putting a stent there has two purposes. In the case of the melody valve, to decrease the incidence of a stent to fracture, stent valve to fracture. Before we used to put a stent, the melody valve used to fracture in more than 35% of the cases. In the case of the Edwards valve, because it's a short valve, the height is only about 13 to, to 15 millimeter, it's short. So to be accurate, just put a longer stent and then you put the valve inside the stent. And we use the balloon technology to uh, deploy the stents in the RV artery tract. And then we keep repeating angiography until we are sure that the, uh, the stent is uh, in good position. Then you need to eliminate any residual gradient or any significant residual gradient any gradient less than 15 millimeter mercury between the MPA and the RV is acceptable. If it's more than that, you need to use high pressure balloons. And when I talk about high pressure balloons, we're talking about pressure 15 to 20 atmosphere using either the Mullins balloons or the Atlas. I prefer the Atlas because they are non-compliant at all. And you can see in this patient, you deploy the stent, but there is residual narrowing. So then you go ahead and put a high pressure balloon, but even the high pressure balloon burst because these uh, calcification, they have spikes and they rupture even the strongest balloons. You can see that patient, it ruptured. And then you use a, a, a much higher uh, pressure balloon to eliminate the gradient. And if the gradient is less than 15 millimeter mercury, then you can proceed to putting a valve. If the gradient is more, I advise you not to put the valve because then you will end with significant residual gradient. So this is a, a, a patient uh, with a homograft uh, injection, free PR, we did the measurements. Then we will do the selective coronaries. It's far from the RV of the tract. Then we will do the bare metal stent. If there is a lot of calcification, you can put a covered stent. But if there's no uh, calcification, you can put just a bare metal stent. You open it up there with the bib balloon. 
then once you deploy the bib balloon like this, then you remove that balloon and then you start touching it up with higher pressures. After each step, and geography is important because you don't want to miss the section and you keep inflating higher pressure balloons. Then you repeat the injection, no dissection, no rupture. Then you bring the, in this case, the Edwards balloon to put it in the middle of the landing zone, in the middle of this Palmas stint. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes you need certain maneuvers to uh, uh, take you to the landing zone until you are in the middle of the landing zone, you push, you pull, you push, you pull until you come to the area where you are and then you inflate the balloon and then you assess the result. And once you assess the results, you stop the procedure and you close the area where you puncture the femoral vein. You see the repeat angio, no pulmonary insufficiency and it looks very good and then you uh, finish. Now, Having said all of that, that the procedure is really a great procedure because you're putting a valve without uh, opening the chest, there are potential complications from stent to fracture, which I mentioned. Now, the stent to fracture rate in the melody valve is 5% or less. The Edwards valve does not have any stent to fracture. Coronary impingement. 6% of the patients, the coronary arteries are very close to the RV of the tract. If you're not careful and you put a stent without good assessment, you compress the left main and you kill the patient on the table. So this is really important to assess the proximity of the coronary arteries to the RV of the tract. And if it's close, you, kill, you call it a day off. Always, always the surgeons are available to do surgery on these patients. So you refer the patient for the surgical valve replacement. Device embolization, that's rare, but if it happens, unfortunately, you can have some maneuvers. You bring the valve either to the IVC or to the branch pulmonary arteries, and if you cannot do that, then you call the surgeon to bail you out. Uh, Paravalvar leak is very rare. The fear complication is homograft, rupture, and dissection. Fortunately, this is rare, but to, to, to avoid this, gradual dilatation of the stent. So you go initially with a certain diameter, close to the diameter of the uh, original homograph. But if you want to go larger, you go one millimeter increments. And if you have this section, you've got to be uh, uh, you know, uh, ready to implant a covered stent that's available in your cat lab. Infective endocarditis, this is, fortunately, it's not common. It's about two, maybe to 4%. Melody valve has proven to have slightly higher rate of infective endocarditis than the Edwards. But quite honestly, Melody, Edwards valve, and surgical homographs, they all get infective endocarditis. As I mentioned, it's not common, but you need to be aware. So what we do nowadays is we send the patient to the dental clinic before these procedures, to make sure that they don't have any dental caries or infections or anything like that, similar to what our surgical colleagues do. Finally, of course, death because of the rupture of homograph that you cannot bail these patients. Fortunately, this is rare. This is, sorry for this noise, a 29 millimeter, a 29 year young patient had Ross operation, then had the Tyrone David operation, and in 2002 had a homograph. You see this angiogram, it looks beautiful, it looks that the uh, on the frontal, the uh, patient uh, left main coronary artery looks very good. We inflated the balloon, the frontal with the balloon inflation looks good, but watch when we inflate on lateral. You see the frontal, the left main looks good with the balloon inflated, but look at the lateral, there is narrowing there. If we did not do the lateral, we could have missed this one. So to prove that, we did IVAS. We did intravascular ultrasound in the cath lab to see how big is the left main becomes when you have balloon inflation. You can see now we put the IVAS in the left main, and then we inflated the balloon, and then we started looking at the IVAS under our eyes, and you will see it now, look at the left main is big, inflation, smaller, and smaller, 
and the smaller and the smaller. So if we put the stent there, this patient will have a problem. So this patient, we terminated the procedure and we said to the surgeon, this is a surgical valve. So this is for patients who have a homograft. But I mentioned majority of the patients, they underwent what we call a transannular patch or Many people, they call it native. Actually, it's not native because they did already have surgery, but we, we call it native because there was no conduit between the RV to the PA. This constitutes the majority of the patients. How can we help the majority of the patients? We have different valves and devices. Some of them approved, some are not approved. Venus P valve is approved only outside the US, but you can have access to it under compassionate, uh, you know, uh, cases in the US, Metronic Harmony is approved in the US, but not approved outside the US, PT Valve, another Chinese Valve, Pulsta Valve, Korean Valve, Altera Adaptive Pre-Stent. This is not a valve, it's a stent, I'll show it to you. Then you implant a valve inside. So it's, a, a, it's an RV alpha tract reducer, if you say, and then the My Valve is a copycat of the Edwards Valve, I'll show you that also. So let's talk about the Venus P Valve received CE approval just last week, nitinol, self-expandable, porcine pericardial tissue around the uh, frame, as well as the leaflets themselves are made of porcine pericardial tissue. This is an image of the valve. The valve is designed, so on my left-hand side, the bottom frame is the distal part of the valve. So the distal part is not covered by the pericardial tissue so that you can anchor this valve at the branch pulmonary artery so that you will have entry to the LPA and the RPA. And the remainder of the valve is a straight. And then the portion, which is in the RV of the track, is larger by 10 millimeters so that it anchors in the RV alpha tract. We did first in a human in 2013 in Shanghai in two patients there, and do, both patients are doing very well. This is a 13 year young boy, had trans and a patch. Look at his RV endostatic volume index 204, ejection fraction 40 of the right ventricle, regression fraction is 40%. So we do the same steps injection. Severe PR, balloon sizing came up to about 30 to 32 millimeter in diameter. You can see it. And there's slight wasting there. You measure it. And then you do the uh, injection in the RV. Also injection in the ascending aorta for the coronary arteries, frontal and lateral. As you can see, the coronary arteries are far. Then we chose a, a, a valve 32 millimeter diameter and the 25 millimeter length. 25 length is the straight portion. The flare portion distal and the proximal are 10 millimeter each. So this valve in reality is 45 millimeter long. The good thing about this valve is the release of the valve. It's calculated, slow, the patient is stable because it's self-expandable. And you rotate the knob in the handle until you deploy the entire valve. And then you can see the branches are wide open because they are not covered. And then you do a, an injection in the MPA, no regurgitation at all. And you look at the coronary arteries and the coronary arteries are wide open, no impingement, nothing at all. So really a great procedure to do for any patient. This is the valve and there is your left main and the LAD and the coronary arteries. A clinical trial was done in China as well as a clinical trial was done in Europe and actually my site in Doha, we were one of the sites because I'm the global PI on this device. And the, as I mentioned, the valve received uh, CE approval just about a week ago. Other devices available for our patients is the following. The Harmony valve, this is from Medtronic received FDA approval March last year. Early experience was restricted to size 22 millimeter, but we know that patients who underwent the transannular patch, they have larger diameter. So the company made another size, which is 25 millimeter. So they have two sizes and already uh, the valve received approval and they started their commercial 
expansion, but unfortunately, just last week, the valve had to be recalled because the delivery system actually had an issue. So they, uh, they are on temporary hold, I would imagine six months to a year until they figure out the delivery system, uh, what, what's happening with that. But the valve is good and serves a certain segment of our patients. This is an image of the valve, is covered by this uh, tissue here, available in two sizes. These were the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the trial which was done in the US. And this is actually the first device that receives FDA approval before European. Usually it's the other way around, but nowadays just for you who deal with devices, the European approval has become much more difficult than the US approval. So now the pendulum has swung in our favor in the US. The second valve is a Chinese valve. Uh, the third valve is called the Pulsta valve. This is a Korean valve, again, for seeing pericardial tissue, similar in concept to the venous B valve, not exactly, because most of it is like tubular in design with a slight flaring at the distal end and the proximal end. And the valve is undergoing a CE trial uh, in uh, European countries. The other device approved uh, in the US, but it's not a valve, it's called the Altera Adaptive Pre-Stent. So it's a self-expanding nitinol frame, polyethylene tetrathalate PET covering. The inflow and outflow diameter is 40 and 47 millimeters. So this actually, will uh, serve even the, more, the larger sizes in patients because the Venus and the Harmony, they will serve patients up to about maybe 34 millimeter in diameter. This device, you can put it in patients up to 40 millimeter. And then there is constriction in the middle of the valve where you will implant the 29 millimeter Edwards valve. So really it's a, uh, it's a good, uh, design uh, taken, in my opinion, after the Venus B van, and it requires 16 French cheese. So this is the stent. You can see it very similar to the uh, Venus B van, uh, but it's a controlled release, self-expandable, and the length of the uh, device is 48 millimeter, and the diameter is 47 millimeter at the distal part and 40 millimeter in the proximal part, and the construction is a 27 millimeter, and then you put a 29 millimeter in the middle without any problem. The last uh, valve that we use for pulmonic valve is called my valve. Again, it looks exactly like the S3. It's a, it's a valve made of uh, cobalt chromium. Uh, it has CE approval. Uh, the advantage, it comes in sizes all the way to uh, 30.5 millimeter uh, diameter. So this is really good news for our patients because with the current available technology, we can help our patients with either balloon expandable valve or self expandable valve. So this is just uh, images of the uh, valve. And you know I, I understand that there is litigation now between Edwards and this company because they are impinging on their design. This is you know not for us, this is for the litigators and the lawyers, uh, but for us, at least if it's available for you to, to use for the pulmonic position. It's the same valve that they use for TAVI for the aortic position. So to conclude, both the Melody and the Sapien valves are balloon expandable and available for transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. These two valves, they cater for approximately 25, maybe 30% of the patients. However, the majority of the patients, they uh, underwent what we call the transannular patch. The results of the Melody and the Edwards have been very good, low risk of complication. I want you to make sure that the most feared one is impingement on the coronary arteries and rupture of the homograph. And that's why your lab has to be equipped with cover distance as well as with a surgeon to bail you out if you have any problems. The newer valves 
have been designed for patients who underwent what we call transannular patch repair of tetralogy of flow, venous, uh, p valve, harmony, pulsta, and of course, the Altera adapted pre stent is not a valve, it's a stent, but it's a reducer of the right ventricular tract. You can pull it and then put the valve. I'll end here. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you may have. I'll stop sharing here. Thank you so much, Dr. Hijazi. That was a phenomenal review of transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. And um, we have a few questions from the audience. I'll start with a question from Dr. Zogby. Um, Dr. Zogby says, thank you, Dr. Hijazi, for a true state-of-the-art presentation. With percutaneous valve availability, are some guidelines for pulmonary valve replacement too late? Is outcome compromised long-term? Thank you. This is actually a great question. Thank you, Dr. Zogby. And again, I'm sorry not to see you uh, physically. So the, the, the major question is, when is the right time? Is it too late now or, or not? You know, uh, the guidelines right now are strict. We require a right ventricle in diastolic volume about 150 to 160 ml per meter square. There are many studies in the literature saying that if you replace the valve at around this time when the RV is about 150 to 160, the chance that the RV will remodel and will come back to normal is very high. So we say, why don't you wait until that, uh, you know, volume is achieved. If you subject the patient when the volume is 170, 180, there is no guarantee at all that the right ventricle will come back to normal. You will stop progression of the worsening in the, in the size of the right ventricle, but the right ventricle may not recover, may not remodel and come back to normal. So the question is, why do we have to wait until you know it's 150? Why can't we do it 120, 140? The reason for that, because right now the stakes are too high. What do I mean by this? The complication rate are serious. You're dealing inside the heart. If you do something and you end up with a massive you know, hemorrhage or uh, embolization of the stent or something, at this time, no lawyer will stand with you in court to defend you. But if you do the procedure, when you have the numbers that are indicated and you have a complication, I think people will forgive you and they will defend you. And that's why. But I think only experience and improvement in the design to make the procedure is uh, bulletproof, you know, for dummies, then we can do it. For example, the PDA, we do, you know, PDA closure for tiny PDA that it is sometimes it's silent. You don't even need to close it. But because the procedure is so safe, we do it. When it comes to transcatheter money valve, I think for now, let's respect the guidelines until our experience becomes bigger and the device becomes really, really user-friendly, that complication rate is extremely low. Then we can say now we can decrease these, uh, you know, these numbers. Thank you so much, Dr. Hijazi. Dr. Hewlin wanted to be with us today, but he's in an emergent case in the cath lab, but he, he has a couple of questions for you as well. Do you think there's a difference between bovine pericardium versus porcine pericardium versus bovine jugular venous tissue for the pulmonic position in terms of hemodynamic function, durability, endocarditis risk, or any of these? That's a great question. So I know for sure, and this is not based on scientific data, but from, you know, based on our clinical experience, that the contagra that we use from the bovine jugular vein the, the chance of having endocarditis is slightly higher when we use it to uh, make a, a, the melody valve. Why is it higher? Is it because of hemodynamic disturbance in the RV of the tract or because of the tissue itself? Quite honestly, I wish we know the answer. I know that right now, some people, they say, well, the porcine pericardium tissue is better than the bovine pericardium because the calcification is less, but there is no solid data. You know, some companies, for example, the Edward company, they are great with the bovine pericardial tissue. So they have the technology down to a science and they have 
you know, uh, proprietary uh, agents and all of this to prevent calcification. The, the final answer and the honest answer, we don't know. It's all speculation. Some companies are good with the porcine and they use porcine. So we don't know. I, I wish if, if anybody knows the answer, maybe Dr. Zogby, if he has any insights into that, I, I have no idea. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hijaz. You have a question from the audience. Um, <clears throat> how does the durability of the percutaneous pulmonary valves compare to TAVRs and surgical valves? Great question. So, you know, we've been doing a pulmonic valve now since early 2000. And I can tell you, I have personally patients that I have put a percutaneous pulmonic valve over 10, 12 years, and the valve looks pristine, looks clean, no problems at all. So there is no question there is durability in these valves. Now, how does that compare with the left-sided circulation? I would imagine so far so good because we have now long-term data with, with TAVI that they are lasting five years. Some patients now we have 10 years, some patients slightly longer, but the, the judgment in the pulmonic position is the size. The larger the size that we put, the longer the, size, the valve will last you. And if you put a melody valve at 16 millimeter diameter, I know that this valve is going to last you maybe two to three years to four years. But if you put a 26, 29 millimeter, I know this valve will last long. As I mentioned, and again, with the conflict of interest, I worked on the VSP valve. My patients that I did the trial on them, you know, all their valves are 28 millimeter and above, very large. And with echo, the valve is good. Even if they start deteriorating, I still have the chance to do valve and valve because my landing zone is 28 millimeter. So I can put a 27, a 26 millimeter without compromising the area, the size of the area that I have. So I think the durability of these valves, if they are the right size, and when I say the right size, not just for the patient, the right size in general, because you know, a, ten, you know, a, a five-year-old, the right size is 16 millimeter. But that's not the right size that we need to put the valve there. I need a size 22 millimeter and larger for good durability to, to last this patient 10 to 15 years uh, you know, of their life. Thank you, Dr. Hijazi. Another question from Dr. Lin. What is the next most important step forward in innovation of RVOT interventions? Great question. So. You know, when we uh, evaluate these patients and we do echoes and CT scans, I wish I can say that all patients are eligible for uh, these valves because, you know, these valves, although the size, we still have many patients we cannot serve with the current technology. So now, of course, when we send patients to the OR, we talk to our surgeons and we, you know, give them recommendations how and what size and what operations to do so that down the road, if this patient needs a valve, then we can say to them, okay, we can implant the current valves. But all these valves are metal valves. They're gonna degenerate. They're gonna you know, calcify. They're gonna become regurgitant, stenotic. So the next breakthrough will be with a stem cell and bioresorbable technology. I know that with coronary artery disease, the, the bioresorbable stent technology did not unfortunately advance, but still I am optimistic that this will come back and we will use bioresorbable stent technology. So if I have a bioresorbable frame and I have stem cells from the patient himself or herself to grow a valve, that's where science is heading. And there are animal trials now on bioresorbable slash stem cell technology. I, one of uh, the, the workers on this is a colleague of mine in Bristol, UK, a surgeon, uh, Massimo Caputo. He's working on this. And I'm hoping that, as well as the group in Boston, uh, Boston Children, Dr. Pedro Donido, working on this. So this is where we are heading, not just for the, the uh, percutaneous pulmonic valves, this is true for devices, intercardiac devices, ASD, VSD, PDA. Let's use bioresorbable technology, stem cells, where you will not, you know, you leave nothing behind. That's, that's the key. Thank you. And then I have a last question. I know you've, you've uh, 
You were the first to describe the use of eyes for treatment of ASDs and PFOs. What imaging study are you most likely to use to guide your transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement? Do you tend to do more eyes versus TE? And is there an advantage to one over the other? I think, you know, uh, Nadine, as probably I'm sure you know that the number of people that are proficient with ICE is very low, mm -hmm. number one. The cost of the technology is high for outside the U.S. Even the U.S., you know, you know, cost is important everywhere, not just outside the U.S. So because of these two factors, I do not think that ICE use will be more than maybe 10, not even 10% of the patients. TEE, you know, the patient is under anesthesia. So having continuous monitoring while the patient is in the in the in the cath lab with TEE, in my opinion, is very important. And actually uh, different times that TEE is monitoring the patient and the echocardiographers see something before the interventionist and because of the fusion function, all of this, and alert the uh, intervention. So I think with TEE imaging, I would say more and more people are heading that direction that, you know, I want to do a safe procedure. And if I have the technology, I want to use every technology available. So that's from, you know, uh, echo imaging. Of course, in the cath lab itself, now we are using a 3D technology, rotational and geography, all of this to help look at the entire area. So multi-modality imaging has become so integral in our day-to-day -day practice. You know, I, I pull the CT image, the MR image, I put it on my screen in the cath lab. We do uh, 3D rotational geography. We do 3D TEE. We do all of this so that at the end, I provide my patient with the best technology and the safest technology available so that they can have the best outcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Hijazi. It's been a true honor having you with us, and thank you for a true state-of-the-art review of transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. We hope to see you in person in Houston very soon. Thank you so much, guys. And, uh, you know, uh, innovation is so important in this area, and I'm sure you have so many smart people in Houston at the Methodist, so uh, continue to innovate. And uh, I would love to visit your center uh, one day to, to be with you physically. And if you guys ever come to uh, Doha, and I'm sure some of you will come here for the World Cup. It's uh, November 21st to uh, December 20th. And if anybody wants to come and visit me, I'll be more than happy to host uh, any of you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hijazi. Thank you so much. Take care. You too.